Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our, our class today. I had, uh, had a question that was asked uh, this week and uh, by email that I thought was worthy of taking some time to uh, share uh, that question and, and work through the answer a little bit. Um, the individual wrote in and said, uh, you know, I hear you talk about a spiritual revolution. And uh, so I, I want to know what you mean by spiritual revolution. I've always thought of a revolution as being kind of a, a bloody operation. And, uh, and uh, so I, I'm not sure that the term revolution is a very good term to be applied. Katie, bring that computer up, please. <clears throat> Technical issues, thank you. Very good. So, the, uh, so she didn't like the idea of, of revolution. I understand that. That's a, a legitimate <laughs> concern. Okay, so why would you use the term revolution? Well, <clears throat> you know, the, the earth uh, revolves around the sun. That is, it kind of makes its turn. <clears throat> so revolution has to do with turning. And um, the printing press, for example, was a, was a great revolution in, in information distribution. So the um, <clears throat> a revolution doesn't have to be bloody at all. Um, Darwin, uh, the Darwinian revolution was a revolution in thought. See, so it's had bloody overtones, but the, the revolution itself wasn't, wasn't bloody, okay? So, if we talk about spiritual revolution, then we're talking about a change in, in thinking. And um, in other words, the, if we just look at a little bit of history here, thinking in terms of the, um, the way things develop in, in Western civilization, you know, when Gutenberg uh, did uh, develop the, the printing press, that made it possible for uh, people to translate the, the Bible into modern languages and uh, made it uh, economically feasible to distribute it. So if, you, if everything has to be hand copied, uh, you go through all the labor of translation and you don't have any way of uh, distributing it. But if you can have a printing press, then it's really worth your time to translate it. And so in history, that's exactly what happened. So we started getting the Bible in German, we got the Bible in, in French and the Fran Bible in Spanish, we got the Bible in uh, English, okay, which was a tremendous blessing. Uh, the, of course, when they tried to get his, uh, freedom, religious freedom in Western Europe, it was a challenge. One of the things they figured out real quickly is that they're going to have uh, religious freedom, they're going to have to have political freedom, and uh, not so easily gained. So the fact is they were never ever able to completely gain political freedom in Western Europe. It eventually took the, the development of the British colonies in North America, specifically the United States uh, and the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights to get the freedom the people needed. So that resulted in what's known to history a little bit as the, as the Restoration Movement. And their goal was to uh, re restore the first century church. First they called themselves reformers. But um, a reformation, the goal of a re reform is to take an existing institution and just <clears throat> reform it. So the Protestant Reformation, for example, uh, Luther just, he didn't want to start a new denomination. He just wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, so there's no reform movement in history that's ever worked. You can't, you know, there's too much momentum inside these institutions. Uh, so you can't reform. So they figured that out, and so they started using the term restoration rather than reformation. Waller Scott, after he preached Acts 2.38, that was a modern novel thing. The way he put it uh, when he preached that in, uh, I believe it was November 11th, 1827, in what's now Lisbon, Ohio, he said that day the gospel had restored to it publicly and practically that not ought not watch that which ought not to have been lost. Okay, so and he wrote a book in 1836 on it entitled "The Gospel Restored." See, so their idea was that they were engaged in a restoration. That is, they were going to restore uh, what happened in first-century Christianity. Okay, 
the, basically the problem with the, the restoration movement, it, it basically kind of pretty much flattened out um, in connection with the Civil War in the U.S. Uh, in 1861 to 1865 and pretty well split the restoration movement into two and eventually three, <clears throat> three branches uh, headed in, in kind of different directions. The, uh, and so there's a certain amount of stagnation that, it, that came in there. So, you know, some of the things that then we've been involved in is, okay, we've, we've taken a look at that and uh, seen where, where things could be done better and more scripturally. Uh, the, the problem is once again you have a movement, those movements tend to, tend to stagnate and there tends to be a, a system of, of thought, kind of a status quo uh, that you have to maintain. Um, some years ago I, I wrote an article for a guy named Hal Hudson, I guess this would be back in the 1970s. Uh, Hal was a preacher from the Eastern Shore uh, Delaware and he spent a week with me and really enjoyed the time. He asked me to write an article for a publication that he had called The Christian Contender. And uh, so the article was entitled The Unfinished Reformation. The, uh, for a period of time I had a subscription to the something called The Gospel Advocate uh, out of uh, Tennessee and a lot of the articles you know in The Gospel Advocate would be have some place in this near the statement this was all settled long ago. And so I'm asking myself the question, who settled it? Who met in plenary conference? You know, who had the ability to, to decide that everything was all settled long ago? But that sometimes is the attitude is uh, that it was all settled. The, so one of the things that we, we took a look at was the idea that you can prove that the Bible's the Word of God. Um, Early American history, you didn't have to prove that the Bible's the Word of God, it was just assumed that it was true. But with the rise of the Darwinian Revolution, then you actually have to go back and prove it. And you can prove it uh, on a, in, in an inductive proof, okay? uh, which I won't go into the details of that. And essentially what happens is uh, Old Testament prophecies of history establish the Old Testament is the Word of God. Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah established that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the Word of God. And Old Testament prophecies of the church or the kingdom established through Acts, that Acts through Revelation is the Word of God. And that's the very bared down nubbins of the, all the elements that, that constitute the proof that the Bible is the Word of God. But you can do that. And it's critical in our time that you be able to do it. Um, you can, you know, what you're running up counter is uh, is the emotional approach. And uh, our whole world is being shoved in the direction of, of uh, feelings are, are what counts. And you have to divorce uh, feelings from it in order to, to get to the facts. So um, we're not looking for a feeling, we're looking for uh, logical uh, proof that the Bible is the Word of God. Second point of the spiritual revolution is proving definitions. Okay, in other words, and that'll put, maybe it'll come up in class later this, this morning here, but you, you can prove key definitions from the scripture. You don't have to say, well, this is my conclusion. You can actually go through and, and show where the, the definitions can be proven, they can be nailed down. Now, what that does is that sets in motion the possibility of of making disciples, the first, second, third, you know, 26th generation, because you keep taking them back to the original standard. You take them back to the standard of Scripture, standard of actually proving the definitions. So once a person understands those definitions and how to prove those definitions, you know, then the average Christian can go take on the Assembly of God pastor or, you know, Baptist pastor or whatever, and, uh, and more than hold their ground. So you have a, a system of actually making disciples in place, which would be another aspect of the spiritual revolution. Another thing would be the, um, you know, restoration um, <coughs> of the idea of the new concept of the new creation. Generally what happened in the restoration movement is the idea was you, when you're immersed into Christ, you change state. Um, Alexander Camel's little 
um, you know, monograph entitled Remission of Sins, which I've republished, and if somebody wants a copy of it, I can get it to them. Uh, you can get it online as well. Um, but, you know, his main emphasis in remission of sins has to do with when you get immersed, you change state. And he used his example. He was a native, uh, native of the United Kingdom. He was born in Northern Ireland. Um, so he's part of the, the British Commonwealth. When he came to the United States, eventually he got U.S. citizenship. And when he got U.S. citizenship, he changed state. And so he compares the immersion to that change of state. <laughs> he doesn't talk about the uh, being a new person on the inside particularly. It's more that you're, you're a sinner uh, forgiven. So, you know, what we're looking at is the fact that if any man is in Christ, he's actually a new creation. The, the idea is, is that you uh, have been created in Christ Jesus for good work. So there's actually a new person on the inside. More on that in the, in the message later today. Also, the connected with that is the, the gospel of the glory of Christ. It wasn't that just Christ died on the cross, and uh, somehow the cross is the center of gravity, as kind of the, the subtle concept is. He was buried, and, and he was resurrected, but didn't stop at the resurrection. See, the, the real work that Jesus did is, was Jesus accomplished in glory. And so the, the proper emphasis of all the things connected with Jesus and glory is another aspect of the spiritual revolution, the, the changing thinking that's going to be necessary. And finally, the, the concept of what worship is. Uh, generally, in the restoration movement, worship is regarded as five channels of public worship, uh, praying, singing, giving, uh, communion, and, and the preaching or teaching. So, but that's... You know, that's totally unbiblical. Um, the, and, and so the, the concept of worship being the inner man in the presence of God really needs to be emphasized because that's what God is very concerned about. So those are aspects of the, of the spiritual revolution, and it is a change in thinking, and so that's why we call it a revolution. We'll turn your Bibles today to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. In uh, verse 12, Jesus has the apostles together here. Uh, he's on his way from where they participated in the, in the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper and he instituted the Lord's Supper. Well, he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in John 16, 12, he said, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Now Jesus had already talked to the apostles. He said, look, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. The Jews are going to get me. They're going to turn me over to the Romans. The Romans are going to crucify me. And on the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. And so he had said that. Now, they didn't hear that, you know, to some extent their minds were closed or blocked off or whatever. But, they, you know, he told them that. Now, what he's got to say here is the things that are going to happen beyond his resurrection that he can't even begin to share with them now. Now, my point here, though, is that the Holy Spirit is actually guiding the apostles into all the truth. Okay, that's his purpose and his goal. So when the Holy Spirit comes on the apostles in Acts chapter 2, from that point on the truth is just a little bit progressively revealed to the apostles and eventually recorded in the New Testament for our benefit. Turn to Acts chapter 2. The church began on the Lord's Day, um, day of Pentecost, which I think this year is the last Lord's Day of, of May. Um, in Acts chapter 2, then the, the church came off the ground. Verse 41, Acts 2, 41. So then those who had received his word were immersed. And that day uh, there were added about 3,000 souls. And they, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. There's a word that's an exact equivalent to teaching. That word's doctrine. Now a lot of people don't like doctrine. I remember after I became a Christian in Great Falls, I was 
pretty zealous. I was showing the old Jewel Miller uh, film strips as they were in those days to everybody and everything that moved. And so there was a, a coffee house uh, there that they'd set up, a quote Christian, unquote, coffee house called the Quarterstone Coffee House. And they invited people to come down and make presentations. So <clears throat> I loaded up my my projector and my, my film strip entitled God's Plan for Redeeming Man. And, uh, you know, I had uh, my uh, big screen that I had to haul with me, set everything up. Um, it was an early uh, little mini cassette tape recorder. I was able to drag, drag that along and set it up. When I got done, um, they told me, well, we don't want doctrine in here. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> Unconsciously, what they said is we don't want any teaching here, okay? Because uh, teaching and doctrine are, are exact equivalents. Now, the, uh, you know, what they meant by that statement is we don't want any specific denominational doctrine. Uh, so you can't bring, you can't talk about immersion uh, into Christ in here. You can't bring Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16 in here, okay? It's what they, what they meant by that. But so the apostles' doctrine here, Acts 2.42, apostles' teaching, apostles' doctrine. Okay, so that's another name for the entire New Testament teaching is the apostles' doctrine. So it's always going to go back to, to what the apostles taught. Uh, if you turn to the book of Jude even, uh, Jude chapter 1. Um, Jude, of course, is uh, brother to James and... Uh, Looks like they're half brothers of Jesus, and were their sons of Joseph and Mary. But in Jude uh, chapter one, verse sixteen, he says, uh, "These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you." In the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. See, even Jude is taking people back to the apostles. It's always going to go back to the apostles. Jesus set it up, so it's coming from Jesus through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, and after that, it spreads out to everybody else. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. See, what, by having it just everything go through the apostles, see, then that eliminates all these other false things that tend to, to pop up everywhere. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul said, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Paul's apostleship is being ta attacked here in Corinth. And, of course, they're attacking his apostleship in order to attack the doctrine. See, if you can attack the apostleship, you can tear the roots out from underneath the doctrine, and then you can go ahead and teach whatever you want to teach. See, so Paul brings them back. He says, look, when I was there, when I started this congregation, all the signs of an apostle were performed among you. Okay, in other words, if somebody else is going to claim to be an apostle, they better be able to do what the apostles can do. And uh, they can't. So that's why it's a, it's, it's, it's a solid way of establishing the the truth of the scripture itself. So the, <clears throat> the apostles' doctrine is here in the New Testament, and the apostles' way of salvation is pretty clearly laid out. Uh, specifically, we've been talking about all the, the false things working against the, the, the teaching of immersion. If you turn to Galatians chapter 3, in uh, verses 26 and 27, and uh, I just want to touch on this one. Galatians 3.26, he said, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who are immersed into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. A plain reading of the scripture would tell you that the way you get into Christ is by being immersed into Christ, and that's how you become a son of God through faith. So being saved by faith through grace includes immersion. And so we've spent some time, you know, talking about some of these guys that try to get out from underneath that. Um, I want to look at um, Matt Slick, number 13, a conclusion here. <clears throat> I say one of the guys I've, I've drawn on here is a guy named Matt Slick. He's got a website, and um, the, so I pulled this stuff off of his website. And, uh, you know, he thinks that the immersion is an outward sign. Uh, he's gone through, you know, several weeks of argumentation here uh, that we brought up, trying to say that, yeah, just like circumcision was a sign, 
in the Old Testament. Immersion is a sign uh, of the New Testament, but that's all it is. And so, in uh, this conclusion here, at the top he said, before we would get to the word conclusion, he says, if you understand the baptism is a covenant sign, then you can see that it is a representation of the reality of Christ circumcising our hearts. Now, you know, Paul in uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 29, talks about our hearts being circumcised uh, by the Holy Spirit. In Colossians 2, 11 and 12, it talks about in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh um, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in immersion. See, so when he ties it back in, he's, he's trying to say, well, the circumcision of the heart already happened through your faith in Christ, and immersion is a sign of the circumcision, or, or the sign of that spiritual circumcision. And uh, that, of course, is not what the scripture says, but that's how he's getting there. He said it is our outward proclamation of the inward spiritual blessing of regeneration. It comes after faith, which is a gift of God. And he quotes Romans 13, 3 there, and the work of God. So in other words, once again, there's a, still a Calvinist base in there that says at some point God zaps you with faith. If faith is not the process of actually reasoning your way through the testimony of the scriptures. Faith is something that God gives you. God is cherry picking people of this world and giving some of them faith, and he's not giving some of them faith. That, of course, is counter to the scriptures at the core. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, but this is how they get to where they're going is, is by fancy footwork like this. And you have to be aware of it. Um, you know, I was looking through some stuff uh, this other week, and it's the same old thing over and over and over again. Uh, immersion is an outward sign uh, of an inward faith. Uh, it's a public proclamation of the faith that you have, and there's not a scripture in the New Testament that says that. See, they're all very plain. You're immersed into Christ. And you're immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You've got to rise and be immersed in order to have your sins washed away. I mean, it's, it's clear through the scripture. And uh, what your goal is, you're trying to help people look at the scripture rather than look at what the big names might have said about it. Okay. So Slick's conclusion here says, Baptism is not necessary for salvation. It is the initiatory sign and seal into the covenant of grace. As circumcision referred to the cutting away of sin and to a change of heart, and he lists a bunch of scriptures there. Baptism refers to a washing away of sins. He's got Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21, Titus 3.5, and to spiritual renewal. See, in other words, his point is, he's got all the scriptures quoted there. He's just hoping you don't actually go take a look at what the scriptures actually say. Because, <laughs> you know, it ref when he says refers to... See, that's his weasel word for saying, yep, the salvation occurred, and then your immersion is, is a sign of that salvation. He said, the circumcision of the heart is signified by the circumcision of the flesh, that is baptism, uh, which is really doing grave injustice to Colossians chapter 2. Okay, uh, Matt Slick, number 14 here. Um, he has one last thought. <clears throat> He says, if someone maintains that baptism is necessary for salvation, is he adding a work his own to the finished work of Christ? If the answer is yes, then that person would be terrible risk of not being saved. The answer is though, no, then why is baptism be maintained as being necessary, same way that Jews maintained that works were necessary? Okay, once again, we got... You know, in this conclusion, we got a multitude of confusion factors all coming together on the, the interstate of a mass rush toward destruction here. Okay, the, you know, the, the assumption then by the time we get to this is that baptism is a work. So if you're, if you're maintaining that baptism is necessary for salvation, then you're maintaining the way his reasoning goes that uh, your works are necessary in addition to what Christ did to you. See, and they always like to use the term the finished work of Christ, the finished work of Christ. Uh, you know, by that, they essentially mean that what Jesus did on the cross, okay, which that, that's a misnomer there to start with. But 
when you know that immersion is actually faith, then faith is not a work at all. You're not adding anything to the, quote, finished work of Christ at all. You're just being obedient to what you're supposed to be. I used the illustration before. If you're out here on a, on a lake someplace and your little boat capsizes and some guy comes along in a little bit bigger cruiser and he can handle the waves and he throws you a rope and he says, now here's some instructions how to get this rope on so we can haul you to safety. Uh, you're not saving yourself by following the instructions. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, in a sense you are. You don't follow instructions. You're not going to save yourself. But really, you know, the, the work of salvation is being done by the guy that's there with the cruiser and, and uh, handing you the life rope. That's a picture of what Christ has done. Now, he's got a set of instructions then as to how you're going to enter into salvation. And his instructions are immersion. So these are all a major conclusion collection of weasel words. He said, so if you're, if you're maintaining that baptism is necessary for salvation, then you're really, in, in effect, not going to be saved because you're adding works uh, to, to salvation, and that's, that's going to guarantee that you don't go to heaven, okay? So he says, if your answer that baptism is necessary, you're making works necessary. If your answer is no, then why is baptism being maintained as necessary? So then he thinks, then he's got you. Either way, you answer yes or no, he's got you. Okay. The, the point is, is his, his total foundation of thinking is wrong. And when we're processing false doctrine, that's the thing that we always got to pay attention to. You got to look and see where did they sneak the false proposition on and where did they begin to reason off that false proposition. So that's, uh, that's my work on uh, immersion here. Um, I wanted to start talking a little bit more about the, the Holy Spirit and uh, the confusion factors connected with the Holy Spirit and the false doctrines there. And, um, but before I get into slick on the Holy Spirit, I want to take some time and, um, and go back through a, a quick review on how you prove the definition of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now I usually use immersion into Christ, immersion in water and I use baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the reason I do that, I mean, it's, it's, it is immersion. And, and the fact, in the, the, the thrust of immersion or baptism in the Holy Spirit is, immersion is not only a dunking, a dipping, a plunging, but it's also an overwhelming. And so the baptism in the Holy Spirit was actually an overwhelming, uh, so, something just overwhelmed uh, those that are so baptized. But I use the word baptism in the Holy Spirit because a lot of the people when I'm studying with them as new Christians trying to get a grasp on this thing, if I use immersion for water and then I use baptism in the Holy Spirit, that helps them to make a distinction in their mind and, and grasp the concept easier. Now, again, it's important that we prove these definitions. One of the early books that I, I read after I became a Christian was a commentary on the book of Acts by a guy named Gareth Reese. It's a good commentary and uh, I got a lot of good stuff out of it. The, uh, but he, he just came to the conclusion. He said, well, there's, there's three measures of the Holy Spirit. There's the baptismal measure, there's the indwelling measure, and he's the, there's the gifts measure. He didn't take the time to prove the definition. He just came up with his conclusion. Okay. Well, if we're going to be in a position of, of making disciples and having this system of discipleship du duplicatable, then we've got to be able to prove these definitions. So I wanted to take a few minutes and, and go back and, and show how you prove what the definition of the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is. And I want to start in Mark chapter 1 and, uh, and verse 4. Sometimes the, the challenge here in uh, proving definitions is number one, knowing where the dots are, and then number two, knowing how to connect the dots. Okay, because if you miss a dot, then you know, then you're you know, you're not going to be able to prove, or you know, or knowing how to connect them. Uh, it's very much like a, a, a geometry proof that the, the kids do in geometry. You know, there's a certain set of steps that you have to take in a certain order because the logic requires that. And uh, the same way with connecting these dots here, there's a, there's a logical order for the dots. 
And uh, you have to be able to, to process that logical order. So Mark chapter 1, and uh, um, verse 4, says, John the Immerser appeared in the wilderness preaching an immersion of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's the immersion in water. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being immersed by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locust and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sins. I immersed you in water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now here's one of the places where John says the big guy that's coming after me is going to be the guy that's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Now I usually use Mark 1.8 here. Uh, you could use the parallel scripture in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, but it brings in baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. And um, those are two separate things. Okay, Baptism and fire is something separate from the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I just usually use Mark 1.8 to kind of uh, keep it clarified and clear, keep it simple. So John here said that he was going to, that Jesus was going to immerse or baptize in the Holy Spirit. If we go to John chapter 1, in uh, verse 29, some of these scriptures we've, we've come across before here, and they're a little bit different setting. A lot of scriptures are intersections. And uh, so there's, you know, streams of thought going this way through that particular verse of Scripture. There's another theme of thought coming through another direction. Um, in John, you know, the Scripture is really like a, you know, each Scripture verse is like a jewel. And a jewel has lots of different facets to it. And so that's the way the Scripture is. And that's why the, the New Testament really is the most complex and orderly arrangement of information in the entire universe. You know, human DNA is awesome. Three billion lines of code, um, you know, arranged to make and to maintain you, okay? But DNA just is information that gives you physical life. The New Testament, the Word of God, contains the spiritual information necessary to give a spiritual life and to maintain our spiritual life. So the New Testament's the most complex and orderly arrangement of information in the, in the entire universe, okay? So these facets, these the, the, the jewels, uh, these scripture verses, see, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things involved in those. So John chapter one, verse 29, talking about John the Immerser, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who sa takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came immersing in water. We spent some time last week talking about how John had the name Immerser because he was doing something that nobody else was doing. And he makes it plain here, you know, that one of the reasons that he's immersing is so that the Messiah could be manifested. So you can see this immersion is a new thing and is not part of Jewish custom. Verse 32, and John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven. Okay, in other words, Jesus has already been immersed at this point, and the heavens have opened up and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. John is testifying to this after the fact. I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to immerse in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen, have testified that this is the Son of God. So once again, John's point is that Jesus is going to be the one who's going to have the authority to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Now, it's significant here that all throughout the Gospels, as this is talked about in different ways at different points, all you know about the baptism in the Holy Spirit from the Gospels is that Jesus will be the one who does it. You don't know what it is, you don't know what's going to happen, and you don't know who it's going to happen to. All you know from the Gospel counts is that Jesus is going to be the one who's going to actually carry that out. With that, let's uh, jump over to Acts chapter 1. See, in other words, people try to read a lot of things into that when Jesus, when John said, I baptize you in water, 
but the big guy coming after me is going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. See, they, they draw the conclusion, well, we got baptized in water first, and then we're going to all get baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're, they're reading stuff in there that they don't have the authority or the right to get in there. So Acts chapter 1, and verse 1, says, The first account I composed, Luke writing this, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now Jesus had lots of disciples. Of those, he chose 12 men initially, and later on Judas is added to that number, and then later on Paul. <clears throat> but right here, it's going to be the 10 plus a few other guys like uh, uh, Matthias hanging around, okay? But he's, he says he's got the apostles here, and he's given orders to the apostles, not to all the disciples. Not every disciple's an apostle. Only very select individuals were apostles. And as we mentioned earlier, you have to be able to establish your apostleship by doing the miracles. Those, those days are long gone. Okay. So in verse 3 it says, To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So it's to the apostles he presented himself alive over a period of 40 days. And you've got to lodge that number 40 in your brain. You've got to get a big fluorescent sign going 40, 40, 40, 40. You need to hang on to that. Verse 4, then gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard it from me, John immersed in water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay. So now we got another piece of information. We know now that it's the apostles that are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we got another piece of information. We know that that's going to happen within what Jesus would call not many days from now. So very soon, the apostles are going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We still don't know what it is. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we do know it's going to happen only the apostles. So Jesus uh, takes the apostles then to the Mount of Olives in, uh, in verse 9. And after he had said these things, uh, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, and they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. Now, it's pretty clearly angels that suddenly appear there in white clothing, and they got inside information. Uh, that Jesus is coming back in the same way as he left. Okay, so the angels got some information about the overall plan of God too. Okay. But what I want you to notice here in verse 11 is that the apostles were called men of Galilee. Okay. In other words, the apostles were all Galilean. And that's basically the only group you're going to find that's all Galilean. There's going to be mixtures of Judeans in with the Galileans here. So in verse 12 it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, near, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Now Luke here, he doesn't tell you what a Sabbath day journey is. Okay, he just, you know, assumes that you're going to know it or you're going to go back and dig and find out what it is. Okay, the uh, Pharisees who had seated themselves in the chair of Moses, um, they uh, said, okay, well, we've got synagogues now. We didn't used to have synagogues when the uh, law of Moses originally came in, and so we're going to have to travel some distance. So what they did was they calculated the distance of what they thought was the furthest tent uh, from the tabernacle that would have been in the center. And uh, they said, well, you can at least travel that far on the Sabbath day. And of course, if you wanted to travel further than that, what you'd do is you'd go out a day ahead of time, you'd put a glove on a fence post, but, you know, and that wasn't regarded as travel, you know, because you, and you can set up your cap, another fence post, and, you know, you can set up so you can travel quite a bit further than the normal distance. So, Sabbath day's journey would be basically from downtown Jerusalem to up to the, to the Mount of Olives, is what it is. And you can look on a map, and you'll get a pretty good idea of how many yards that is. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, roughly a kilometer, actually. Um, so that's a Sabbath day journey. Now Luke doesn't tell you that. Okay, he just says there's about a Sabbath day journey away. Okay. Acts chapter 2 then, 
Okay. Um, in verse 1 it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, <clears throat> they were all together in one place. Okay, now Luke doesn't tell you what the day of Pentecost is either. Okay, you got, you got to figure that out. Now the Jews had three feast days that are mentioned beginning in Exodus 23. And uh, the first of those feasts was Passover. The second one was the feast of the beginning of the harvest. And the third one was the, the feast of the end of the harvest. You know, known as uh, unleavened bread, feast of Passover, unleavened bread, uh, Pentecost, and then tabernacles, okay? So the, uh, those are the three feast days. But, so you've got to figure that out. Pentecost is a Greek word for 50. <clears throat> and uh, the reason it's, it's 50 is because during the Passover week, there's a Sabbath, okay? Passover operates on the moon cycle. So Passover can be any day of the week because the full moon can be any day of the week. But somewhere in that week is going to be a Sabbath. And so the Jew is supposed to start counting from that Sabbath 50 days. And uh, the 50th day then would be the day of the feast. Now, the way that works out, the 50th day, the way they count, is always in what we would call a Sunday, or first day of the week. So Pentecost is always a Sunday. And so the day of Pentecost is a very set day. And every Jew is required, every male Jew was required to be on the temple grounds for that feast. So when it says the day of Pentecost had come, they, that's the apostles, were all together in one place. That's going to be on the temple grounds someplace. Now they can't be in the temple proper. See, the, the temple proper was, would be the, all the rest of this is temple grounds. It is massive um, with all kinds of alcoves and everything else where a person could teach and preach and um, but the, the temple proper, only the priests could go into the temple proper. And the way that was set up, uh, one, once a day, one of the priests would be chosen by lot. We know that from Luke chapter 1, to go in and burn incense. So they're not going to be the house, as we're going to see here in a second, and not going to be the temple proper. It's going to be someplace on the temple grounds. So verse 2 then, Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, fill the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them as, tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, this is the apostles here. Remember, Jesus had promised the apostles that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, furthermore, Jesus had said not many days from now. If we go back to when Jesus lifted off the earth here, which is about the same time he said, you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That was the 40th day. So if we think of, of Jesus' resurrection here, because Jesus' resurrection was also the day they started counting to get to the day of Pentecost. Jesus' resurrection to the day of his ascension is 40 days. Okay. Now, the day of Jesus' ascension to Pentecost is 50 days. So you can see it's only 10 days from the day of Jesus' ascension to the day of Pentecost. That fits the time frame and not many days from now. So here we are, day of Pentecost, right time frame, the apostles together, where Jesus promised they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Boom, three things happen. Sound like the wind, tongues like fire, and speaking in other languages. Furthermore, see, down in, uh, in verse 7, the crowd is amazed. They're astonished, saying, all these guys that are talking are Galileans. Okay, in other words, it's very clear to the crowd, probably by the way they dressed, that the guys are all up there delivering their message with a, a flame of fire actually resting on their head. Each one of those is a Galilean. See, it's only the apostles were Galileans. Jesus promised that this would happen to the apostles, and that's how it's being carried out. So, Peter takes his stand then in verse 14 and delivers this Holy Spirit inspired message beginning with the prophecy out of Joel. Okay. And uh, when we get down to verse 37, it says, When they heard this, the crowd heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? See, it's not just Peter that's delivering the message. Peter's maybe delivering the lead message, maybe in the Hebrew slash Aramaic of New Testament times. But somebody's delivering it in Greek. Somebody's delivering it in the language of the Parthians. Somebody's delivering the message in Latin. Somebody's delivering the message in the language of the Egyptians and Cyrenians. There's 12 different men 
delivered in the same message in 12 different languages. And so their sector, the crowd, because crowds naturally segregate into a, a language they can hear. If you've ever been in a, in a foreign country and uh, you hear an English word spoken, your ears pick up really fast. Oh, I heard English somewhere. Uh, and uh, you'll gravitate because you're much more comfortable uh, hearing the, the message in your language. And so they're not just asking Peter what to do, they're asking all the apostles what to do. So we let, that's how we know that all the apostles are delivering the message. Acts 2, 32, Peter said, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we're all witnesses. And therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, Jesus, has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Now remember, John the Immerser promised that Jesus would be the one then who would pour out the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Here Peter says that what you guys just heard and what you just saw, Jesus did that. So this, this pulls it together. This precisely defines baptism in the Holy Spirit, the sound like the wind, tongues like fire, and speaking in other languages. And, uh, the, and Jesus did that. Now this is going to happen one more time. We go to Acts chapter 10. See the purpose in Acts chapter 2 was so the people present would, uh, would believe um, the testimony of the apostles that Jesus was raised from the dead. So Acts chapter 10, we got a Gentile soldier by the name of Cornelius, and an uh, angel appears to him, tells him to send down the sea coast for one Simon Peter, who's staying with the house of Simon at the house of Simon the Tanner, down by the sea. The men are dispatched, they come to where Peter is. Next day, uh, Peter is uh, uh, got a vision here in verses 9 through 15 and of a blanket being let down from heaven, all kinds of unclean animals on it. And a voice says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter, you know, comments that he's never eaten anything unholy or unclean. The voice says, what God cleansed, no longer consider it unholy. Okay, at that point, then the guys sent from Cornelius, from Caesarea, were beaten on the door asking for Peter. The Holy Spirit told Peter, go with these guys without any doubting. I sent him myself. Now, this is hugely significant here because this is the first uh, step of the gospel to, to reach the Gentiles. And the Jews are resistant to it. Okay? So, Peter went with them, and there are some guys that went with Peter also. Peter comes into the house after some initial parley. Uh, they, they get it set up. Peter comes in and preaches to them. When he gets down to verse 43, Acts 10, 43... Um, talking about Jesus, he said, of him all the prophets bear witness, and here's the key words, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. When he says the word everyone, that's the problem. So this is going to require some backing. So in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised, all the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So they're hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And Peter's response is, can any man forbid water for these to be immersed who received the Holy Spirit just as we did? Okay. But the uh, point is here, something about the Holy Spirit happened to the Gentiles that included speaking in tongues. And it happened from heaven. It happened without any human intervention here. Uh, but you don't have enough information to know exactly what this is. So in Acts chapter 11, you get more information because you got a recap here. Uh, Peter's called on the carpet in the, by the church in Jerusalem for going to those Gentiles and eating with them. So Peter goes back and explains everything. And when he gets down to verse 15, he's describing what happened at the household of Cornelius. He gets down to verse Acts 11:15. He said, "As I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as He did upon the, us at the beginning." Okay, there's three questions you want to ask, but you've got to ask them in kind of reverse order here. First question you ask is, what's the beginning? Well, the church began in Acts chapter 2. What happened uh, at the beginning? Oh, okay, just at the beginning. That's going to take you back to Acts chapter 2. Uh, if it was just regular speaking in tongues, the apostles, you know, Peter would have said, well, what do you know? Here it is again, praise the Lord. It doesn't. It goes clear back to the beginning. The us at the beginning was the apostles. He says, just as upon us at the beginning, just as is a very descriptive word, means exactly the same way as. 
So that lets you know that although the speaking in tongues is the only thing described in Acts chapter 10, that all three signs were present, just as means in the same way. And so that triggered in Peter's mind what that was. He said, I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized or immersed in water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he said, therefore, if God gave to them, the Gentiles, the same gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as he gave to us, the apostles, also after believing in the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could stand in God's way? So what you had was you had this tremendously powerful sign to open up the way of salvation to the Gentiles. It's not only necessary for that to happen in order for people, Peter to immerse these guys in water in Jesus' name, it's also necessary for the church as a whole and to enable them to take the gospel to the Gentiles and to welcome the Gentiles. That's why there in verse Acts 11, 12, the Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. That's the messengers from Cornelius. He said, these six brethren also went with me and we entered the man's house. Those six brethren, unnamed brethren, some of the most important men in the history of the world because they're the ones that verified Peter's account of the baptism of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the Gentiles and thus the fact that salvation was now open to the Gentiles. Without these men's testimony verifying what Peter said, the gospel would have never gone to the Gentiles. It's on such little things as this, you know, big things hinge. So this is the definition of baptism of the Holy Spirit. It happened once on the Apostles' Day of Pentecost. It happens the second time, Cornelius. Now, the Apostles, in addition, okay, when the Apostles are baptized in the Holy Spirit, three things happen at the same time. Okay, they're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and they also receive all the powers of an Apostle. They've got the ability to perform miracles, raise the dead, um, cast out demons, speak in tongues. They can do all that. But they also have the power to lay hands on people so that they also will receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so those three things happen to the apostles at the same time. They're separate things. Now, when Cornelius was baptized in the Holy Spirit, that was a sign for the benefit of the Jew those of Jewish background who watch it so that they would welcome the Gentiles in. Cornelius did never got any power of an apostle. Cornelius never got any power to do miracles or anything else. All there was was the outward sign. That's, that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. You're looking for an outward sign connected with baptism. It's baptism of the Holy Spirit that's the outward sign. And it's there to verify the testimony of the apostles in the first place. And there to verify the welcoming of the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. Now, that's necessary because as we start moving into uh, these guys on the Holy Spirit, I'm going to take a little bit of time with, with Matthew Slick on the Holy Spirit. So there's a uh, slide there and uh, Slick Holy Spirit number one. Okay, this is coming out of his website. And uh, so the title of this is, uh, What is the Baptism in the Holy Spirit? Okay, now he's, he's got to do some foot shuffling here because... He's coming more from a perspective that baptism in the Holy Spirit is the entrance of the Holy Spirit into the life of the born-again person, okay? And, uh, but he doesn't want to alienate the Pentecostals who think that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, all right? So you, if you watch here, you know, he's pretty careful about how he places his feet, okay? But it's instructive here to see how much confusion there is when you don't take the time to define things, approve a definition like we just did. He said, baptism of the Holy Spirit is a term used to describe a movement of the Spirit upon and or within a believer, usually sometime after a person is saved. Okay? There's controversy surrounding this phenomenon as to whether it's legitimate or not. See, here's his, his shuffling of feet here. Um, he doesn't, in other words, you can tell subtly that he doesn't think that speaking in tongues is a part of the, quote, Christian experience, but he doesn't want to alienate anybody from reading his website, okay? Uh, some people believe that once a person is saved, the Holy Spirit is in the person, and there's no subsequent baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's where he's coming from. In other words, they maintain that baptism occur, a spirit occurs at salvation. In other words, the coming of the Holy Spirit into your heart is the baptism of the Spirit. Now, that's why it's really important once again, we prove the definition. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is these outward signs happen twice. Indwelling Holy Spirit happens when a person is immersed into Christ, and that's not the baptism of the Spirit. And there's gifts of the Spirit given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. 
See, he can't get one paragraph into this, and he's already got everything massively confused, okay? In other words, they maintain that this baptism of the Spirit occurs at salvation. That's the coming of the Holy Spirit. Others believe it's possible for the Christian to experience an additional movement of the Holy Spirit sometime after salvation, you know, i.e. speaking in tongues. Generally speaking, it's the charismatic movement that supports the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, before we close here, I just want to take, make a couple quick comments. The Pentecostal movement you know, gets its name from the day of Pentecost because of speaking in tongues. Uh, charismatic movement, which is the equivalent to the Pentecostal movement, gets its names from the charisma, <clears throat> charisma of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So uh, that's what he talks about when he says the charismatic movement that supports the baptism and speaking in tongues, in other words.